Hi friends, we all know that UPSC has released the final results of civil service examination and Mr. Prem Sagar has secured an All India rank of 170 in this quoted examination. So we are fortunate that we have with us today Mr. Prem Sagar. We would like to ask him some questions, mostly the tips or strategies that can help the other aspirants to crack this examination. And in my experience of last few years, many students have asked me some common doubts. They have got some common fears. We would ask Mr. Prem Sagar to clear some of these doubts or fears. Okay, we welcome you and congratulations once again. So how are you feeling with the success? Yes, uh, thank you once again. And uh, also I thank you for this opportunity because uh, whenever I was preparing, I also used to have these kind of doubts. So that is why I'm, uh, I am thanking you for the opportunity to clear some of them. And if it helps any of these aspirants, then it would be of a great purpose. Yes, so uh, feeling wise, yes, completely. It's a kind of a mixed bag of emotions. I'm 90-95% uh, of happy and then 5% of disappointment. And there's a bit of uh, surprise as well. So it's a kind okay. of... So may I know why the disappointment as you've got a very good rank, right? Correct, correct. So you all know like uh, whatever may be the rank, like we all tend to aim higher rank. So before I'm in the list, I was expecting that if I will be in the list, then I would be happy. But after getting into the list, then I feel like, okay, I might, if I try more, then I would have been somewhere in the top 100. So that is a kind of 5% disappointment. That doesn't uh, completely explain my entire emotions. But it's okay. a 5% of thing that is there. Okay. Because you know that if you are at 170, you still don't know what kind of service you will be allocated to. So okay. you don't want to end up again writing the UPSC. So if you would have okay. got 100 below, then I would have been pretty sure about my preference and okay. uh, the allocation. So that is the reason. Okay, okay. So we understood that. We understood that. Can you tell me what are your service preferences in the civil examination? Okay. So my first preference is IFS, that is Indian Foreign Service, and then I have uh, Indian Administrative Service. Okay, then... that's actually kind of very different because generally most aspirants of IAS at the top. Uh, may may I know why you have chosen IFS as a first preference? Correct. So many of the aspirants used to like many of the friends I have spoken to also have opted for IAS. But this is only a uh, common belief that IAS is the most preferred thing. Even uh, the top rankers are nowadays preferring IFS. And moreover, the more I researched about IFS, it, uh, it, it has convinced me more to get into that service. Because IFS is something, our IFS officers are not usually, you know, uh, like available in media or not accessible through the media. And second thing, they usually don't have the direct impact. That is the only difference. But regarding the impact and the service they provide, it's almost like equal to any other service like IAS. And also I have a personal inclination towards international affairs. So from the start of the preparation, I was very clear in my mind. So like I have this personal interest in international relations. Because IR is something which is changes like every minute. And it is the most dynamic part in the entire preparation. So I like that challenging thing. Like today you might have a good relations with the country. And within a year or two, or even because of some incidents, that entire relationship may completely go a 360 degree change. So that is where the challenge is. That is where the diplomats step in and try to, you know, again, uh, flatten the curve with, of relationship and then try to better the things. And uh, nowadays, if you see, like uh, in the newspapers also, globally, uh, we are getting like 50% of the news coverage or more than 50% is on international news. Like if you see the recent India-China episode or even before that, the coronavirus and the WHO uh, scenario, all of these are global scenarios. And as India is rising, we have more opportunities outside. So I believe there are, like if you see the long career of 30, 40 years, the next vision of 30 years, then I believe uh, it is IFS that has more, uh, more opportunities to do. And uh, also on the other side, because of that decentralization phenomena, and also there are multiple bodies like the lower tire that is getting strengthened in India. There might not be the same kind of impact that whatever the IAS might be doing now. So, okay. Many reasons. The personal okay. interest is the main reason. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So we understand why you have chosen IFS at the top. And also, as you know, very well, 
uh, many aspirants uh, may mostly fail at the first stage, the prelim stage. Most of them may even have the capability to crack the mains interview also, but still they fail at the prelims. And we have seen uh, some rankers also who get some rank of 600, 500, and then they want to write once again. And again, they may fail in the first level, the prelims itself. So in this context, can you please explain what strategy you followed for the prelims and what helped you clear the prelims exam, prelims stage? Yes, uh, this is unfortunately true. Like many of the toppers, like when they start their attempts, like usually they get stuck up sometimes in the prelim stage. So it's very important to clear the prelims and to have strategized the prelims preparation. Because if you see 90-95% of the rejection rate is at prelim stage. And after that it will be much lesser. So I believe what I did uh, differently is, usually what people say, like many toppers say is, integrate your preparation. That is true to an extent, but don't don't integrate that to the level that you prepare always only in an integrated manner. So what I did is like exactly three, four months before prelims, you need to get into the only framework of prelims mode. Uh, what I mean by this is because this is a kind of an objective questions, like you have to choose the answer. You have the answer, but you have to choose it among the uh, options available. And that is the most trickiest part. What happens usually we remember the information, but we will not be able to identify the option based on that information. So you have to get into that prelims mode exactly three months before. And second thing, so three months before you have to leave all other mains, answer writing everything, and then just focus only on the prelims preparation. That, uh, that is by solving more and more test series. In test series also, you have to do the full length ones. Because usually what we do when we start the preparation, we do sectional kind of tests. If you end up doing only sectional things and do only four or five full length, then you might be at a disadvantage because you might be comfortable or uh, like you might score very good in one subject, but not in the other. But when you see the UPSC paper as a whole, UPSC doesn't divide the questions into subjects or silos. It always asks in a different way, but people tend to separate those questions in a subjects. So don't try to do that do attempt full length test. That is very important. Another important thing is prioritize. Prioritization is very important because you cannot expect uh, same kind of questions from every kind of subject or topic. For example, I said, don't separate them. But at the same time, there are certain subjects where you get more output by putting less inputs. For example, art and culture is there. What we do, we either read Nitin Singhania book, and then there are a couple of NCRT, NCRTs and then we do certain practice. But if you see the output ratio from the last four years, there are very less questions on art and culture from the static part. Instead, UPSC is asking on the current or applied part. So like you don't get the dances or art forms or these kind of questions. Instead, they will ask if there is any tribal festival that happened in the last one year or any tribe that is particularly vulnerable or any scheme that is invented. So it will go into that background. And even then, it will be like three or four questions that comes out of art and culture. So don't invest one, one and a half month in art and culture and just score only those four or five months. Instead, focus on international affairs or environment. These are the areas where you are getting more marks. Like at least you will get five to six questions in that area. So if you spend one month, then you should get at least that kind of output. So in this way, give the priority list to what you should study. Even within the subject also, you should again prioritize or strategize. For example, if you see the history paper, you don't need to invest the same amount of energy in all the sections like ancient history, medieval history and modern history. Instead, focus on modern history. In the modern history also, focus on the events that is past 1935. If you see 1935 to 1947 is the most, uh, like the most important area where number of questions have come. So this is how you have to strategize. So when you are reading, you have to read everything in history, but focus on certain aspects. For example, when you are going through ancient history, focus on areas like when there is civilization. That way you will cover history and art. For example, Vijayanagara kingdom from the last five, six years, at least once in two years it gets repeated. So when you see that pattern, focus on that. Similarly in geography. So in this way, by solving previous year questions of UPSC, you will pick up some patterns, like where it is focusing. For example, similarly, when it comes to modern history, it focuses on certain movements where Gandhi is part of, but it will not focus on Gandhi, but the other leaders who have contributed to the Gandhi led movement. For example, the Gandhi Satyagraha, which was started in Kerala, who led it? 
so that is important because we tend to ignore that and focus on gandhi so pick up these kind of patterns and next time you think like upsc if you are upsc what would you do so if you ask these questions to yourself you will tend to read also in that way so that is oh. something that can help okay okay so what you mean is we have to get into the mode of upsc by going through the previous papers and understand the pattern and prepare accordingly and right. as you told as you told very well how we have to invest most of our time in those areas where you can get more questions from at the same time current affairs almost some 40% of the upsc films is of current affairs yes. so uh, can you please share some of the sources that you have followed for this current affairs uh, yes so i i would actually say it's not just 40% but even sometimes it's like 60 to 70% of the paper is from current affairs i would not say directly current affairs but current affairs inspired questions they what they do is they don't ask current affairs but they will ask on a static part that is related to the current evening event in the last year so that is why current affairs is very very important in this upsc preparation but uh, so what i did is i didn't refer to any kind of booklets or magazines so that is first thing this is because of personal uh, orientation so like if i read a vision ias magazine or anything after reading 10 or 15 pages usually i feel as i uh, fall asleep so that is why i don't read them i tried it is not that i didn't try i tried them but it's not my cup of tea uh, my cup of tea so i understood that and i kept that aside so what i did instead is i regularly followed newspaper so i pick up hindu as my regular newspaper so every day i might skip breakfast but i didn't skip uh, newspaper even on the day of prelims so even on the day of the prelims i used to read oh, only the matter is the time that you spend so like just before the prelims i used to read it for uh, 30 35 minutes or one month before the prelims i used to read for one hour or one hour 15 minutes so newspaper is first very important thing next thing notes of current affairs so many people suggest that you make notes of current affairs or newspaper but i didn't do that because i i also tried doing that i ended up uh, writing like one book for one month so i thought it's not feasible to revise them so i've stopped that so instead of what i would advise is uh, you have many videos coming up in the youtube like you have rouse the daily news analysis or many institutes are coming up with their daily news analysis so try to find which is very interesting for you and then just take notes of only very important three things in that day not don't write down everything just take three important things and i write down in notes so that might help you in the revision of current affairs so and and the third thing i used to solve every day 10 multiple choice questions on the current affairs so morning i read newspaper and just before sleeping i used to solve mcqs on this website called insights so where you where they provide multiple choice questions on the same current affairs so that way i used to read and then by afternoon i might write notes on the video and by night again i used to revise by solving the questions so you got the 360 degrees you you read it and then you revised and then you also solved so that is it for the day your current affairs is done second thing if some of the people are starting current affairs very late for example when i have started my first attempt i have started it in january and i have to crack it in june usually we tend to cover 12 months of uh, current affairs so when you start from january Uh, i started january 1st and i also started august 1st current affairs okay so january 2nd and then august 2nd so january 3rd august 3rd this way by the time i complete march current affairs i also completed august september and october current affairs so this way of like dividing into pieces and then studying it like a daily event thing would actually benefit you instead of focusing on revising the magazines the reason is if you start doing Uh, revision of uh, magazines you might be most interested in the first few pages like you have you will have 90% or 100% concentration in the first 10 pages after that normally human mind uh, like your concentration levels decreases so you will not focus the same uh, kind of concentration on the other events so that is why i advise you to break it and read it like a day so like a, i used to pick up the current affairs in that way so that is the thing and uh, another important thing uh, as you have asked i've just uh, thought of i just that's that uh, came through my mind that is uh, bbc news app so what i have is like i have few apps like bbc news indian express and all in my phone so whenever you go for tea or something in bbc news app there is a section called videos and in that there is an one minute video section so they will update that video for every hour so every hour they will pick up top international headlines in one minute so if you just keep your headphones and listen that 
and if you do that for every four hours you tend to cover all the international news so that next time when you tomorrow like when you get hindu newspaper you don't even read to interna- read the international section you have already covered that from bbc and bbc is the most authentic source so that is it you are going to cover the entire newspaper in 45 minutes itself so that way it helps okay so you you made use of the multiple channels i mean the newspaper then the apps as well as mcq questions and online videos everything okay yes. and then you you told about uh, the the notes making for current affairs you told that specifically you made notes from some youtube channel where you heard the daily news okay. what about the static part the history geography economics for these things also you made any notes or you just like just print textbook again and again no unfortunately i didn't uh, made the notes for the general studies or static part because what i i tried this also i tried from the top of strategy itself so i tried making the notes and usually i used to end up writing more or i i uh, don't used to read that again so that is why i stopped making notes so instead i used to have uh, conceptual clarity on those topics and i used to revisit them again and again and the main way of revisiting them is through the again current affairs like if you are trusted reading the current affairs it will never be only current affairs you cannot separate current affairs from the static part for example i will give you one example like uh, if you have uh, recently there is a, this uh, beirut blast in lebanon so that is an important event now if you are upsc what kind of question you might frame usually you might think of that capital city or then country and then what are the countries that are surrounding and the next important thing is what are the rivers that flow through lebanon and then what are the rivers that pa- that were part of ancient civilizations like if you see euphrates is a civilization there so you have to see the entire thing in the map and then you have to see every geographical future possible in that area so whenever a news is appearing then you have to go beyond that news and go study about everything else like what is the religious composition what are the cities what are the conflicts in the middle east area so in this way if you do this 360 degree view you don't need to read static separately similarly for polity also like if you have an issue coming up in polity for example recently there was an issue on anti defection law or with respect to rajasthan crisis what we tend to do is we read hindu we read that uh, these many people have uh, defected and all and then we leave it there itself but what i do is i leave that news i'll not read that news but instead we'll go to the governors i'll, I'll download the constitution there is a constitution book itself pdf available in law ministry website so i have downloaded it every which time i get it uh, which website law ministry website law ministry okay you have an updated one like they will update for a, after every constitutional amendment so i have the latest one and you will have every article there so after having some kind of good foundation after reading newspapers whenever you get a doubt just go and visit that constitution itself many think that it is very difficult but it is pretty easy trust me i have never read lakshmi kant but i have always referred constitution Okay, okay. Actually, it's very uh, different way of expression because generally we observe that everybody reads Lakshmi Kant book, but without going to the book, you have gone to the actual Constitution of India and it helped you in answering the questions. Exactly. Okay. As you told about the Lakshmi Kant, I would like to ask you one more question. Generally, everybody reads NCRT for either history, NCRT spectrum, geography, NCRT, coaching, Leo. Polity means Lakshmi Kant. Environment means Jai Shankar Academy book. These are the common books. So, have you uh, prepared through all these books? or you left these things and prepared some other sources for leave the constitution of india as we understand other subjects so i would like to put a disclaimer here because <laughs> i would like to warn everyone that this is my personal strategy because this is not something that is conventional what i'm going to say is a bit unconventional so that is why i'm saying do, do try this at your own risk and that to try uh, test it if it suits you then only try it okay so what i did is i never read any of the standard books i never read gc leong i never read lakshmi kant i never read even this shankar book for environment nothing so none of the standard books have referred but what i referred is ncert so initially for the first reading in the 2018 when i went for the first attempt i have read every subject textbook from 6th to 12th and that too like in a flow i didn't read i didn't read it with the intention of clearing the prelims or noting down i have read it like a story so that way i was able to uh, first i was given first reading of entire ncrt is from 6th to 12th and then in parallel like for every week uh, the fortunate thing is i have read it with the insights test series so there they have given it with the textbook based uh, test series like they will give four or five textbooks of ncrt and then they give a test series 
So I used to reach the four or five and then practice that month current affairs and then attempt the test. So that way it helped me evaluate myself how much I'm able to retain. And next time when I attempt again reading the next textbook, I used to be conscious that I have to focus on certain facts because in the last attempt, I am making certain mistakes because I didn't uh, focused on certain facts. For example, uh, there was an event with respect to Aurangzeb. Like Aurangzeb focused on certain kind of paintings. Or, no, sorry, it is Aurangzeb who didn't like these kind of paintings or focus on them. But I didn't remember that ruler name. I know the context, but I didn't remember the ruler name. So I've made that mistake. So second time when I read a new, new NCRT textbook, I focused on such facts because those are the facts that UPSC is picking up and asking. So that way, combine your preparation of reading NCRT books with the testing or with the practice tests. So that so, way, you will improve. You will constantly improve your way of reading. Your way of reading has to improve. This is first thing. Second thing, my entire preparation was NCRT from 6th to 12th. And next thing, whenever I went for the second reading, I focused only on 11th and 12th. I didn't focus on 6th to 10th because 11th and 12th are the books where 80% of the questions are picked up from. So if you have time constraint, first focus on 11th and 12th. If you have one year or one and a half year time, then focus from 6 to 12th. And once these concepts are like crystal clear for you. And next thing also, don't remember or don't try to uh, note down everything from these NCRDs. First read it like a story. Do it first reading. And then in the second reading, if you feel some facts are important, then you note it down. So this is all I did for films and means. So that is a preparation. So rest of all, and uh, like we all know that we have certain information gaps. So whatever are the information gaps are there because of this preparation, I uh, compensated them by practicing more tests. So in that test, whatever I didn't cover, I used to uh, cover them from the test paper solutions. Okay. So that is it. Uh, okay. So as we understand that you focused on practice exams, you wrote uh, test series of many institutes, the film test series. So right. generally, after you write the test series, after you read the test from any uh, institute, as you uh, calculate your mocks, you'll be going wrong in some questions and then coming right in some questions. So after that, will you leave it there or do you have any uh, follow-up strategy? Will you make note of the questions that you are wrong and analyze something you do after the exam? Yes, this is very, very good question. So like I have two parts uh, here. So first thing is one is strategy. Second thing is analysis of the paper. So what I tend to do is, uh, if I have attempted a paper, usually it takes two hours to complete that paper. So for the two hours, I don't uh, solve uh, like question and then see the answer. I just sit for an exam like how I sit for the UPSC. And then I solve the entire paper and then I mark the options and then I will correct them. So after that immediately or while attempting the papers itself, what I do is I will categorize the questions in four types. First one, 100% confident and second category, uh, so for the 100% confident, I used to uh, mark it with a symbol like star or something. And then where I'm logically deducting the answer, I would do it with a square kind of symbol. So that is second category. And third is something like a gut feeling. So you'll have a gut feeling, you know, you don't know the answer, but somewhere your gut or your heart says that this is the option. So that is third category. And the fourth one is wild guess. So you don't know any idea. Your gut is also not saying anything, but you still want to attempt. Like if you are a guy who want to attempt 100 questions out of 100. So that is the fourth category. So I always used to mark these categories on the paper itself whenever I'm attempting. And after the end of the paper, I used to analyze the scores in each section individually. So like for 100% confident, how many I'm getting correct. So usually I get 80, 85% correct. I never got 90 above. Okay. So that is first thing. Second thing for the logical ones, logical deductions part, I used to get 70%, which is very good. So 70 near to almost 80. So 70% I used to get in logical. And then gut feeling all the questions also, I used to get 60% correct. And surprisingly, even for the wild guess, I used to end up in positive marks, not in the negative range. So with this, I figured out that my strategy or my oriented should be in attempting the maximum questions. This I've repeated for four or five tests, five full length tests of different institutes. So this way, by constant repetition of this, you will, you can come to a conclusion where you should end up in marking the questions in actual UPSC. Because some people say you should attempt 100 questions. Some people say you should attempt only what you know, like 60 questions. But this is something again depends on individual because some people are very good at accuracy. Some people are very good at guessing. So this is something you have to figure out. And the best way to figure out is 
by having categorizing them this is first part second part of the thing is like i used to do two hours test and six to seven hours of analysis so i used to sit completely on the question analysis this is very very important for me because i used to get more pleasure by knowing the answers for which i have committed the mistake because i used to think in a different angle and then answer surprises me with a actual fact and then a deep analysis and i used to go beyond that analysis also for example if there is a question on el nino and somehow i have a certain ambiguity in that question so i know some information but i am not crystal clear and then i have marked based on certain logical deductions and when i study the answer i usually understand like this is not something or I'll, i my concept gets clear i'll not stop there i will once again go and check the video or where i have studied it i'll go and revisit that topic this way i'm doing the revision and that concept will be crystal clear from then so this way next time whenever any question from the topic if it comes then i will be able to mark it correctly so if i miss it again in the next time also in the next paper also if a question comes on el nino and again i go wrong again i will repeat the same exercise so after two or three times of repetition of this uh, i will not be uh, doing the same mistake again so this way i am uh, reducing my mistakes so this is something i did okay and may i know how many questions you attempted in the actual prelims examination this year uh this year i have attempted 96 questions 96 okay um, okay yeah last so year i think there is a max okay okay yeah. so uh, you not only answer the questions that you know but you believe in your gut feeling and you believe in your guessing ability because anyhow you are running up with the positive marks correct okay. but Now, this is not something uh, i am not going by a wild uh, like, yes logical guess yes, yes. because i have worked it like i have uh, seen it in the papers in the practice papers i have seen that the wild guess is giving me net positive result okay. only because of that logical deduction i am doing this Okay. and also i i will also evaluate the upsc standard on the exam date itself if i feel that is so hard and i uh, shouldn't uh, you know attempt some questions then i will not attempt because if you see in the 2018 i have attempted almost 98 questions but this year i have attempted 95 or 96 questions so i have deliberately didn't attempt those four questions because i know this paper is bit hard than that So, okay okay so it should be very dynamic it shouldn't be rigid yes yes, yes and, and these days really prelims is also becoming dicey i mean uh, uh, you will know exact answers for mags and 30 questions so you are forced to guess in fact you are forced to guess anyhow so as we have spent enough time on the prelims let us come to the actual uh, rank getting thing the mains there is a thing where i think uh, uh, the rank the score very high marks because prelims though though they clear with three or four marks it is the mains that actually breaks or makes the civil result so Uh, what is your optional for uh, the optional is political science and international relations and obviously because you are interested in the ifs race also naturally ir so you have chosen that so but do you have any background knowledge on the uh, psir optional or you started afresh from beginning it's a complete fresh it's a zero knowledge on psir and the interesting uh, thing i would like to say is i've chosen my optional without any knowledge that there would be this kind of political science part in this so that is my level of awareness when i was Okay. you know like filling the application so i have just opted psir because there is ir and psir yeah. <laughs> okay okay then leaving the ir aside the remaining part of psir the thinker theories whatever for a first timer how many months do you think it will take to actually finish the syllabus and does it really require a coaching on the theories or without coaching is there a way of learning these thinkers and theories and finishing the syllabus yes so the first part is the first challenging part is this thinker thing so you have this western political thought and indian political thought in this political theory and those are the two time taking things in this entire paper 1 so first of all it's not at all required the coaching is not at all uh, required to complete this or to get an understanding because i am also a guy with zero understanding i am from a technical field so if i am able to understand all these things then anyone can do it but only thing is you shouldn't start with so big technical or like expert books the wrong thing what i did is after my prelims preparation when my results came up some topper have recommended a book with very high technical language and words and the moment i picked up that book i was completely scared like i thought i've chosen wrong option but that is the wrong thing to do you have to go through certain stages just like you go through ncert in option also you have to go through certain books so for that also you have certain books for example for the western political thought the best books are igno books and many people ignore that igno books have very good way of explaining the concepts so you whenever you pick up the optional or if you are trying to choose political science go through that igno 
read western political thought thinkers like at least if you read plato aristotle and machiavelli and if you are getting interest then choose that subject also if you are starting political science start with that and then once you are familiar with thoughts then you go for ideologies and then after once you are familiar with ideologies then you go for the further uh, subjects in that political theory so this is the best way and absolutely coaching is not required for political science as well but what is important is test series because oh, information how many tests how many tests you have written almost for the political science optional <laughs> for optional i have uh, written about 30 tests 30 full 30 tests yes okay uh, that too in three different institutes i have written okay so that is what uh, i believe helped me because in the first attempt also i have read everything about political science but i didn't practice enough and uh, the art of answer writing is very 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 important in political science because it's a very humanity background subject and you have to code certain ideas in a more like a lucid way and within in a in a less number of words so this is an art that comes with practice by constant uh, you know kind of revision and constant feedback that you take and then you work on them so that's why i believe tests are very important than reading in optional so i've read very less in optional but i've practiced very extensively in optional so i've got like feedback from three different teachers and i've worked it i worked on that wherever it is reasonable okay so, okay and is there any two or three standard books that you have to definitely go through along with igno igno is for western philosophers correct, any correct. standard books that everyone has to refer for this optional okay. so for optional one thing yes so for uh, one book i really found is very useful is op goba political theory by op goba so you have 70% of the political theory part covered in op goba you don't need to go beyond that some people suggest this andre haywood books and then globalization of politics and all but i didn't read them because in political science also the key to success is read less and read more times so i have read op goba like around 6 or 7 times so wherever and that too you shouldn't read the op goba from page to page you have to take it by syllabus so first read igno and then pick up the upsc syllabus and see the questions that came up in that syllabus because you would also have a 25 years uh, booklet like on that topics based so first see the syllabus in upsc and then go to that questions and then see in which areas upsc is asking or what kind of questions then you start reading so this way you will end up reading less but you will read what is very much needed in upsc so this way you have to read the op goba because if you see op goba it is 600 page book Okay. and even if you read for one reading it takes two months for op goba itself so that is of waste of time so do this way for political theory and then for igp part and another thing in political science is many students what they do is they start up with the political theory and they end up three months studying only political theory but political theory constitutes only 125 marks out of the entire 500 marks so instead what i think is we should focus more on part 2 of paper 1 and part 2 of paper 2 these are more mark fetching topics and these are the topics where you have less material for western political thought and political theory every topper or every student have the same material so everyone will write very good information but for igp and for comparative politics and for international relations no one has any material so that is where you will have advantage so do research on them spend more energy on them so that even if you read an average on political theory you will end up scoring more than the other guys so this is where the relative advantage you will get so what i did so usually in the market they have shubhra ranjan ma'am notes so that is kind of reference book for any political science and international relations student so i didn't rely only on that because even shubhra ma'am notes doesn't cover every topic with the same attention they focus like they have two standard books or two kind of uh, uh, this spring roll books on only political theory and igb they have one book and similarly for ir entire ir they have one book so i have picked up this igp topics each syllabus wise and have uh, prepared notes from scholar articles so wherever i found information based on this previous year questions i have noted it everything down on this psir so that way it helped okay okay and then uh, i think uh, you would have definitely got very good marks in the psir because you I have spent enough so. time <laughs> spent enough time wrote many exams on that in three different uh, test series so i think you have found all the best things required to crack an optional with a good score so coming to the general studies mains uh, generally gs paper 1 2 3 most students score uh, most students mean among the toppers most the difference will be less but in essay and ethics difference generally will be more is what uh, uh, we hear 
So ethics, uh, let's come to GS4, ethics. For ethics, is there any uh, strategy that you want to share? Any two or three tips, the main points you followed? True. So this is again some of the mistakes that I did in first attempt and uh, tried to correct it in this attempt. So this is precisely true. Here also, you shouldn't put the same kind of efforts on every subject. There are again certain subjects where you will get more marks by putting less efforts. These are mainly optional, GS4 and then SA and if you have time then GS3. So this is your limit. So like GS4 is something where if you put even one month effort completely on the GS4, you may end up at 120 or something. So like even if you have performed average in GS1 and GS2 with a score of like 100 marks in GS1 and GS2, if you get an uh, like uh, uptick in the GS4 of 120, then you will definitely get a good rank. And similarly, SA is something where you don't need to work on information. All you have to work is on writing practice and then improving your way of presentation. Because SA stuff is, the fodder stuff is same thing, general studies. So you don't need to read anything. All you need to do is practice, show it to different people, learn on that feedback and then incorporate that. Also, don't go by the conventional approach. Because uh, what, I, uh, what I usually believe is I try to, you know, kind of be different from what others write. Because in essay, many toppers have always suggested go by this social, political, historical, legal, all these angles. So nowadays, like when you look some people's essay, it will be kind of artificial. Like there will be a paragraph on political perspective, then there will be on social, then there will be on economical. So even the viewer who or examiner who evaluates that paper, he might get an artificial feeling. So don't go by only kind of rigid lines. So I have tried to be different. So in this way, what I did, I have connected contemporary and historical part. I have connected wherever it is needed. So I've just went with the flow. This time I will just explain with an example. So this time there was an essay topic called uh, South Asian societies uh, tend to, or South Asian societies are more woven around societies rather than state. So this is the topic. So my first introduction is uh, the Afghanistan. So I told like during the Kanishka times, we had uh, Kanishka ruler and then uh, we have this lower Jirga concept where people come together and then because of that lower Jirga is a society kind of thing. People come together and then they rule because there is a lot of tribes in Afghanistan. So this is kind of best thing that happened during the ancient times. Then I've immediately explained Cutting short to the contemporary times, the key solution to the present Afghanistan crisis is this thing, where the lower jirga should come up, lower jirga should formulate the peace plan, and they should implement it. So here I'm connecting that ancient thing to the contemporary time. I'm not going by the strict political thing. And then I stated, so here in South Asia, societies are different from state. State is a Western concept. But in South, South Asia, societies are important. So you have diverse communities. In Afghanistan, if you see, there are many tribes. So you have to take everyone's interest only then peace can be sustained so only by convening lower jirga you can establish peace in south asia so this way i've connected the topic to the centerpiece of south asian societies woven around societies rather than state so this way i didn't i'd never maintain this rigid lines of maintaining economic political i've combined everything in the paragraph but i've connected to the main subject of essay so you have to sometimes break this traditional or rigid lines. One thing is that. Second thing you have to strategize. You have to focus on certain subjects. So as I said, ethics is one thing, essay is one thing. And then if you have time, strategy is on GS3. GS2 and GS1, even if you prepare average, you will get good marks. So this is something. And the third part, like uh, coming to ethics part, uh, usually some toppers say like, uh, we all have ethics, so we can directly straight away go to the examination and then can write there because you should have a natural flow and all. But that is not true, trust me, because you have to practice even ethics also. You might know the answer, but there is a way of presenting that answer. Everyone knows the answer. Like for example, if you see a case study in 2017 or something, they have said there are certain floods in Uttarakhand and there are four kind of people, like old age people and then women and then a secretary of other state and you are a district magistrate. So what is your order of priority of selecting them? So everyone knows the answer. Like everyone will pick up either first the old age people are vulnerable people and then women and then this thing. So answer is not about the end conclusion. It is about how you arrive to that answer. So that is something you will develop by practicing and then revisiting on your feedback. So for ethics also, you have to uh, do this. Like you have to write many, many uh, practice many case studies. First thing. 
second thing for the theory part you have to search each syllabus term and then write an your your own example in your notes and then keep revising them along with the quotes so this is what i did for the ethics paper so, so ethics so ethics when writing the answers along with your own ideas did you try to mostly use the quotes or what some thinker said some theory you try to use those things mostly or most of the answer just what you th- what you thought about the case study no i have uh, done both like i have uh, applied because here also political science helped me very much so here also i have incorporated every possible theory but i have incorporated it only when it suits the context of the question i didn't put it i didn't put anything artificially so if i if i start using a quote then it should be definitely relevant to the context that is asked only then i will use even theory wise also and that too if you are introducing theory it should be very crisp brief and that too in one paragraph and then you have to narrate the life experience or actual incident then he will not be bored if you dump like 80% theory and then there is no real life example then that will be a kind of tragedy for your uh, this thing example yes, yes. so you have to incorporate both things and then you have to maintain a fine balance okay and then uh, one more thing generally as you told me previously that what are mistakes you have committed in first attempts you rectified them that's why in the very second attempt you are able to crack the examination with a good rank so okay. generally we hear that in general studies paper 3 the economy part or the, you know the interest the uh, environment part science technology part this part generally those who are preparing for 3 years 4 years 5 years they have more uh, data more statistics more information to vomit in the examination whereas the first timers or second timers may not have that much data then how, how do you think uh, you are able to score well in gs3 in the first or second term generally when you have less data less statistics less information so here uh, i'll be a bit cautious because i'm not uh, i'm i'm no don't know the scores yet but i believe i have done decently yes. so what i did is i never focused on statistics because statistics is something i can't uh, remember even if i try to memorize so whatever they whichever the part there is rote learning i used to skip away so even for the statistics i have skipped it but i didn't skip it completely uh, i'll tell with this an example for example india's growth is there like many people even remember the year to year growth and they can even put a graph okay so i didn't remember at that level but instead i remember a rough estimate for example if i know that roughly 60% of india's employment is right now in agriculture so this is something i know and it contributes only about to 16 to 17% so this is something i know so i approximated always so i approximated to the nearest number and i wrote a word called about or approximately to the figure before okay. that so okay. this is how i manage the statistics second thing another major uh, problem with the statistics is if you focus too much on statistics your answer will look like an artificial thing like you have dumped something which you know but you didn't analyze so that is a problem you need to have statistics but it should suit the context first okay. you have to analyze then you have to put the statistics only to substantiate your analysis so this is what i did for example uh in gs main 3 this year there was an question asking about do you think uh, low inflation targeting and steady gdp growth has left indian economy in a good shape so uh, justify your view with the arguments so this was a question so here some might take that this as a positive statement and then justify it or you can contradict it so i took a contradictory stance so here i said low inflation actually didn't help india but instead worsened the indian economic situation so i first in the straight first instance itself i have explained first the context like how in the recent past the economic growth is slowing down that is in my introduction so i took the context and then immediately i made this conclusion that low in- inflation targeting actually worsened the economy or worsened indian economic shape and then started explaining it so how that is because if you target inflation then what happened in immediately the uh, the majority of our population is 60% of it is dependent on agriculture and agriculture is where the in- low inflation will actually hurt because the prices of agriculture farmers will not get realized so because of that and a good monsoon their incomes have reduced once their incomes are reduced you have 60% of the population with less incomes so your demand will get reduced Mm-hmm. so your demand got reduced so economy will get automatically slow down so this way i have made a diagram of vicious cycle so the same concept that is explained in the economic survey i have just used the concept and i explained it with the diagram in 50 words so this is how i explained with the logical argument of 
uh, this low inflation then similarly i have explained the steady gdp growth i told steady gdp growth is not something india should look for india's potential is increase in the growth rate because you can't grow all the time with 7% and expect to be a superpower or expect to be a uh, prosperous nation you have the potential of 15% growth rate but you are happy with only steady growth of 7% so if you grow for 7% for some years then automatically your economy will not be uh, will be having these kind of problems like npa crisis and all so this is how we have explained the second part so this is what i'm saying so in main's answer also it is not the conclusion that you go for but the way how you explain the answer is important and the second thing the recent trend what i observed from the last 3 years especially is it is not the answers which we know it is the answers which we don't know but still how we manage them is what determines our score in mains because earlier out of 20 questions 10 or 12 or at least 15 questions used to be from the areas which we read so we are comfortable in writing them but now only five questions are from the areas where we read and rest of the 15 questions are completely out of the box and they are same for everyone so now it matters how well you manage those out of the box 15 questions so this is where it helped me in this attempt where i practice many tests so i've encountered many questions where i'd have very little information but still was able to address the question appropriately so this is something that comes with the practice again so here also practice helped and uh, coming back to the statistics always you have to balance the statistics with the analysis only when, only then i think it will fetch you good marks okay so okay. that is and then the uh, you, you told you Okay, and then you told that uh, you have drawn a diagram of Fisher cycle. Generally, yeah. do you prefer to draw more flowcharts, diagrams, wherever possible in the main sense? Overall, if you look at GS one, two, three, four, overall, out of the okay. twenty into four eighty questions, roughly how many questions would have actually drawn that flowcharts, diagrams, or whatever? So, uh, as far as I remember, I have drawn it only for two questions. So I didn't uh, use diagrams or flowcharts at all because I am not kind of a person who is that creative at that moment of exam. Because you need lots of practice for that first thing. Second thing, you have hardly six and of a seven minutes for a question. So it's it's very tricky to you know draw a diagram and that too that should fit naturally in that answer. You shouldn't put it artificially. So I don't have a habit of. you know uh, bringing in diagram even if doesn't suits the context so i didn't find the diagram thing uh, very much suitable for many of the context because in 2018 there was a question for example there was a question on industrial corridors and they were asked specifically to show the industrial corridors so there you have to show it there is no other way and industrial corridors is something where you can show by an drawing in india map but you can't show some geographic concept by just explaining through a diagram for example this year they have difference between air masses and uh, o- sorry ocean masses water masses and currents you can't show that thing with a diagram so that is what i believe it is not something i uh, advise or recommend but this is how i followed so if it only suits naturally there then i do that okay okay and then uh, mostly most of the students who come out of the mains examination the the most common complaint is that they are unable to finish the paper so okay. instead of going individually if you look at 1000 mocks of the all the general studies 1 2 3 and 4 in 1000 marks how many marks have you attempted attempted means you finished the answer sir okay so this is again a very good question because this is a, a precise mistake that i did in the first attempt so in the first attempt because i had less practice and also many of other friends have suggested that if i am able to complete around 18 or 19 questions in the mock test then i'll be able to complete uh, 20 questions in the final test but in the first attempt i ended up only completing 17 questions out of 20 in every gs paper even in optional also i left one or two questions so this is the main reason why i missed first attempt cut off so for the second attempt i realized that and my main focus was to practice 3 hours test in sorry uh, every mock test in exact 3 hours or even 2 hours 55 minutes itself this is very very important because in the first attempt also i used to sit for this 3 hour exam but i used to ask the exam center guy to give 5 more minutes or even if i used to you know extend the deadline i never used to stick to that so that costed me a lot that is why in second attempt whenever a guy comes to take the paper 
I used to immediately give it to them even though I don't complete it. So that way, next time when you are, you are able to write the exam, you will have the fear or you will have uh, taken a precaution to complete the 20 uh, questions. Even then, one month before this 2019 mains exam, I was able to complete only 19 questions. So that fear was there. And then finally, but uh, uh, like I've, to, I've taken a last uh, uh, four mock test, like GS1, GS2, GS3, GS4 in UPSC format just before the UPSC. There I was able to complete the, uh, complete the complete questions, 20 questions in a comfortable way. Then I've got the confidence that I can do it in UPSC. So I advise also others to complete all the 20 questions in the mocks itself at least one week before the UPSC. So that way you'll be going to the exam with more confidence. Okay, okay. And then if you have to write the mains exam again, what things will you do additionally? Uh, do you still think there are some mistakes you have done in the second attempt which you want to change? If at all you have to write. I know you don't want to write because you got a good rank, but if at all, what changes would you have done? Yes, definitely there are uh, many changes that I would like to incorporate this time. So first thing, uh, writing tests is important, but also writing tests in a national competitive environment is also very, very important. You have, it is, UPSC is all about a relative comparison. So it's about a relative performance. How well you write then others is most important in this exam. So before I used to write many of these tests in Hyderabad and many of the institutes are local institutes. So I used to think like I'm doing good but when you compare it with the national performance, it might be somewhere behind. If I would have realized this earlier, I would have pushed much better or if I would have prepared much better and would have performed better. So that is the first thing I would have incorporated. Second thing, I didn't made any notes for GS1 and GS2 because I was completely occupied and optional. I spent 70% of the time on optional and then on essay and GS4. GS3 came naturally for me because I used to read newspapers and then I used to pick the current events and usually GS3 is also a kind of current paper like mostly on applied part it will be but GS1 and GS2 are mostly on static part so I'm very weak in that area so that is where I want to focus now especially on GS1 because GS1 is one is something you have to know that content only then you can make some logical understanding and then you can present the information well. So I would focus on GS1 and GS2 this time. And uh, the third most important thing, I missed practicing optional tests also in this time limit. I thought if I practice enough GS tests, full length test in this three hours time period, that will be same for optional. But that is not the case because you have 20 questions in GS, but in optional, you have kind of have five questions where for the first question, you have five subtopics. And then for the fifth question, you have five subtopics again. So that kind of timing is different. Here in GS paper, you can allocate seven and a half minutes or roughly seven minutes for every question, but you can't do that for optional. So kindly practice even full length tests in optional also. So that is the third thing that I have to focus on uh, this year. And then uh, there are a couple of things like uh, I didn't made any notes for the syllabus part of GS1, GS2. So I would uh, like to you know, uh, focus on certain syllabus part. According to the syllabus, I want to make notes for GS1, GS2, GS3. So that way I would okay. better can revise and present them better. So these okay. are the things. And I think you have elaborately shared most of your opinions and strategies for the mains. Now coming to the final stage, the interview, the personality test. In personality test, broadly, what are the areas you were tested by the UPSC member, the board? Okay, so if I want, if I have to cover it comprehensively, uh, like uh, the first, the, the main focus areas were like confidence. First thing they are seeing whether you are confident or not in whatever you're saying. Sometimes they might even counter your view with an opposite and equal effective one, effective voice. So even then you should be confident. That doesn't mean you have to take the same stand. You can alter the stand based on the argument but you have to be confident in what you are saying. So that is first thing. Second uh, quality what they are saying is presence of mind. So how well you can see the scenario and then adapt yourself to that situation. So that is second thing. And then third thing, independent opinion. Are you just reflecting the opinions that are there in the newspapers or books or do you have an independent opinion of the issue? 
when i say independent opinion that doesn't mean giving a diplomatic answer or saying both positive and negative sides and then choosing an kind of official stance you have to be bold on some things so that that is something that comes when you read an editorial and then you close it and then you think you you have to think after reading an editorial whether what others said is correct or not are you differing with it if you are differing then you have to yourself give a reasonable logical explanation why are you differing for example if in hindu there is an editorial you are you you might like it you might not like it if you don't like it you have to give a logical reason why you don't like it so this is something i used to do i used to close the paper and then i used to think for 5 minutes whether i am able to counter this opinion with a logical thing or not if i can do that by logical thing only then i will counter so this is something will be very helpful in interview because in interview also if you are presenting a contrary or a bold opinion then you have to back up with a logical argument so this is something they see and my interview especially went around uh, in a, like in a different way like they they have uh, completely changed the course of interview based on my answers first it initially started with the daf like why my preference was ifs and then it went into international relations uh, and from there it went to gandhism and once i have answered this gandhism question straight away like 6 to 7 case studies came up so they are complete like situations how do you do it what is your uh, opinion on this so this way it went okay okay and uh, finally one thing very important for every aspirant is what kept you motivated throughout your journey hostels examination maybe this will be your last question okay <laughs> uh, so regarding motivation i believe there are two things that have worked so first thing is i didn't uh, dream big i dreamt very small things like i never saw myself uh, you know achieving 170 or at least even achieving top 100 rank or in the list i always saw prelims as a first obstacle so i have to clear first prelims so for clearing prelims first i have to write today's test so for today's test i have to prepare this syllabus so my targets were always small so if i complete today's syllabus then my next target would be uh, scoring good in that prelims test then if i go score good then my focus would be on full length test getting in the top 20 in the full length test if i achieve that then my target would be clearing the prelims once i clear prelims then mains and then interview so always i am occupied with these small things only i never dreamt of whether i will achieve this rank or not so that is why i don't get demotivated easily because i am completely occupied with the small targets and this keeps changing so that is why one one part is that second part even then in this long preparation every human being is tend to demotivate at some point so usually when we get demotivated one is when we are not interested in that subject so usually i have certain subjects like geography or polity part of polity where i get uh, you know kind of bored or when i spend more time in on less number of topics so i made it interesting myself like by visiting alternate modes of uh, learning for example if i am unable to read geography in crt 11th class in crt because it is so bulk and you have uh, 10 or 12 pages explaining uh, two or three concepts without any diagrams so there i have innovated so i went for alternative sites as i have explained before also there is a set site called metoffice.gov.uk so there you have all the videographic information of geographic concepts so i visited them similarly there is a course called crash course in youtube so where they will explain the historical videos in small 2 minutes frame so i used to visit them so that way i used to compensate whatever i have to read uh, from the text so this way wherever i get demotivated in certain areas i used to like create this interest artificially and then used to work on that subject and third thing never worry about the longer thing always have a smaller vision so this is what i believe so always focus on the next important thing so that way you will be occupied with that thing itself you will not have enough time to uh, think about the larger things and get demotivated these are the things okay. that kept me okay thank motivated. you thank you very much for sharing and uh, thanks for your time and uh, analyzing everything clearly and sharing your tips or study success and i think this will be helpful for the students who are writing this exam this year as prelims is just two months away uh, this video i think will give insights uh, to them for prelims mains as well as interview and uh, thank you once again and we congratulate you once again for success at cus examination thank you so much